Hi, and welcome to RTP Business Live. Our guest today is John Sparath. John is the owner and founder of Blue Ribbon Residential Construction. John, welcome to our show. Thank you for having me. I think we'd like to start off to find out a little bit about yourself and how you got Blue Ribbon going. Yeah, it's a long story, but I'm going to try and keep it very short. I grew up with my, it, my parents owned a 150-year-old house in Pennsylvania, and my dad was not afraid to tackle on projects. So I grew up around remodeling. And uh, after a period, went to college and did all that. And, and I, I ended up back on Long Island. My, I got married, and my wife's family's from Long Island. So um, what we did was uh, I, we went, moved back up. I, I hired on with a remodeling contractor. And after about six months, I said to myself, I can do this better. So I picked a company name, which was also Blue Ribbon, and um, put out a shingle, started working. Back then, the, co the uh, company was, I did the estimates, I did the accounting, I did the pounded the nails, did all that kind of stuff. You wear a lot of hats as yeah, a small sure businessman, particularly and, when you get started. Yeah. So when we decided to come to North Carolina, um, I hired on with a new home builder. And in 96, when Hurricane Fran hit, because of my background in remodeling, he came to me and wanted to start a remodeling company to do repairs on our customers' homes. And about a year and a half later, I bought it from him. So that's how Blue Ribbon came to be here, um, and we've been going now in 18 years. Excellent. Yeah. So you have experience not only um, with a 150-year-old house, but you also have experience with new home construction. Yeah. What makes a fella choose between the two? Is it a... Well, new home construction from a logistics standpoint is, is easier because you don't have somebody living in your construction site. The vast majority of the time, our homeowners, probably 98% of the time, our homeowners are living with us and we're working with them. Um, I do like, I think one of the things that drives me is um, working for somebody and being able to take their dreams and make them reality. I think that's huge and, and that's a personal satisfaction kind of thing. Oh, absolutely. I guess you have to learn to respect personal boundaries and, and figure that out yeah. uh, because you are so close with the folks yeah. uh, as, as their house is changing underfoot. It, and, it, and, and they're always, they hit the wall about six weeks into the project. They get tired of the workmen, they get tired of the dust, they get tired of the inconvenience. You know, if, we, if our guys show up a half an hour early, catch them in their pajamas, you know, those kinds of things are uh, irritations. So when, when they hit the wall, I always warn them, you're going to hit the wall, but it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a lot of upfront that, that you got to get people comfortable because this you is sure do. a big, the home is probably one of the biggest investments they have. Yeah, it is. And the investment that they're making to improve that home is... is uh, Significant in most cases, yeah. Right. Right, so they may be under a little stress at the time anyway, <laughs> yep. and put on top of that folks yeah. in their home. And, and there's, there's also a significant amount of fear. Everybody's seen TV. You've seen the, the, the troubleshooter on TV. Everybody's got a fear of, um, am I, am I go, are they going to take my money and run? Are they going to steal a house key and rob me later on? Are my kids going to be safe when they come home from school? So there's a, there's a pretty significant fear factor. So we give them an opportunity during our design process, and we'll get into that a little later, but we give them an opportunity to get to know us. And they meet most of the people that they're going to see in their house. Well, let's talk about that a little bit. Um, you obviously have years and years in the process. Um, are there things that you do along the way, professional requirements? Are there things that... Um, maybe that aren't required but that you have done uh, mm -hmm. to, make, well, to separate yourself and to give people that comfort level. Yeah, there, there are some, some pretty significant things from a legal standpoint. Um, in North Carolina, any project over $30,000, you've got to have a license. Um, I think it should be a lower threshold, but that's the way it is written right now. Um, and the same thing holds true, and that's, that's by the North Carolina Licensing Board for general contractors. Uh, the um, the thing about uh, workers' comp and general liability insurance, North Carolina law says if you have three or fewer employees, you're not required to carry workers' comp on them. I think that also is a mistake, but that's the way the law is written. So um, we make sure that all of our subcontractors have their own policies, and uh, we verify that through getting insurance certificates. And we provide an insurance certificate from our company to our clients, assuring them that we have the proper coverage. Um, there's also um, 
a number of things that we've done in building this business. Uh, many years ago I discovered, and it was a realization, that um, communications with our clients, if you look at any project that's gone bad, and we've had a few, but every project that's gone bad, if you distill it down to the root cause, it's communications. So we tend to draw folks to us that have a customer service oriented brain. So that our employees, um, customer service people, people who enjoy dealing with the public. Mm -hmm. um, same thing holds true for our trade contractors because they're the face of our company when they're on the job, the electricians and the plumbers and Absolutely. those kinds you of people. Absolutely. You brought them so, into the project. Yeah. They're representing you. I'm responsible. Right. You know, so we take that responsibility very seriously um, because we do 99.9% .9 of the time, the homeowners give us a key to the house. And it's our responsibility to make sure that they're protected. Well, that may lead into this next question I have. Um, you've talked a little bit about what is involved in the process, but let's step back a little bit and get to the how do clients select you and, and how do you make them those raving fans that then refer you uh, to the folks that you also want to do business with? That's a great question. And, and I think that having those customer service oriented people is big. That's huge. Um, we also have um, a process. We're a very systems-driven company, and um, we have a process for the design, the pre-construction work, picking things out, drawing plans, securing a building permit, structural engineering. That's the period where homeowners get to know us because we're not invading their house yet. Um, and we find that if, if for some reason we can't work with them, we're going to tell them we can't work together. If for some reason they can't work with us, we expect them to tell us we can't work together. And that leads to the success of a project. Right now we're enjoying a 97% uh, likely to refer rating on uh, Guild Quality, which is one of our uh, third party surveying companies. That's excellent. So excellent. It, I, I think it's the reputation, it's the care and courtesy that, that leads people to rave about us. And I think it comes back, just like you said, the communication. Mm -hmm. Set those expectations, and it's a complex project. If something is not going quite the way either you want it to or the way they expected it, then that communication yeah. process is and critical. And it Get starts at the beginning. Yeah, it starts at the very beginning of the conversation. Um, and that same communication has to follow through the entire project all the way to completion, walking out the door, shaking hands with the final payment. It's, it's just essential to the success of any project. Absolutely. Let's shift gears a little bit. Uh, I know you have a showroom. Mm -hmm. How does that work in the process, or is that an important part of the process it, with the potential um, folks that you want to work with? Yeah, for, for our customers, I think our showroom, at least in, in my mind, is, is essential. Um, in the past, We've, 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 people have said, we're ready to go do the, do the job, and we start the design process. And I'll give them a list of places to go looking at tile, and cabinets, and countertops, and flooring, and paint colors. So they go out to these places and deal with the, um, the designers in their showrooms. And, you know, when you walk into a tile place, in front of you is 10,000 choices. Where do you start, number one? What's the price point, number two? Because we do constrain people to a certain price point. So if you have an allowance of $4 a square foot for tile, and you choose $7 a square foot for tile, you know what you're doing to your budget. Right. You know, you're pushing it upwards. Um, so those are the kinds of things that we've experienced in the past. And then they pick everything out and they go, I sure hope it looks good when it's, together, when it's all together, right? So about a year and a half ago, we moved into our new space a little bit larger, nicer showroom, and we started putting things in like cabinet door samples and tile and granite samples and, and faucets, all those things. And we actually had an interior decorator join us in the showroom. She's got her own business, but she works with all of our clients in picking things out. So it makes the process more or less, less frantic uh, because she's, she's the one that's steering them and guiding them in what the, what the choices should be. That's significant. 
That's um, big. There's a certain that, overwhelm factor. I oh, think that, it's huge. That you, there are endless choices and, and, and some help in, in narrowing that down and we're helping them yeah. keep focused on budget and the yeah. important. And, and, and the same thing, too, um, when she pulls together the cabinet choice and the, the wall color and the countertops and everything else, she puts together a display palette. Um, so that the homeowners can see how it all plays together. I'm not a color person. Um, I know what color of wall paint I like, but I couldn't pick it out. And um, know that it's going to also work with everything else yeah, that's yeah. being chosen. I mean, I, uh, there's, there's colors that I like that she says, <gasps> <laughs> you know, <laughs> that sort of a thing. But um, that has led to a, a lot of customer satisfaction. And they know going in um, what we do. I do design and draw plans and all that kind of stuff, but she colors it. And the last step in the design process for us is to do a 3D rendering, which is a photorealistic um, view of their kitchen or their addition, whatever it may be. And it's so as close to reality. It. They can see it. And that is huge, because most people can't think in 3D. I have that gene. I'll I can, raise my hand. Yeah. <laughs> well, probably 90% of the population can't. I, I have that gene where I can model things in my brain. Um, but most people don't. Yeah. So the, the 3D rendering is the icing on the cake when it comes to the, the final decisions and say, ah, oh, oh, that's it. That's a huge help, sure. Yeah. Or yeah. can we tweak this at this point? Mm -hmm. but, but and not. sometimes that happens too. Oh, I'm not so crazy about where that window's placed. Right. You know, but those that's kind, the time. That's why we do it that way. Sure. Not, not, not when during the construction. Hole's in the wall. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because right. then it costs us both money to move it. Right. And change right. orders are never credits. Right. <laughs> Always so the showroom is, is pretty. Fundamental yeah, in, in it really process. is. Yeah, it really is. John, I want to shift gears a little bit again. Um, you keep doing that. I know. I know. I'm in about tenth gear now. <laughs> uh, the question I have is, um, I've finally come to the realization that I'm not getting any younger. Mm. Tough one, but yeah. uh, you know, I like where I live, um, and I, I'm probably not alone in that feeling. Right? Uh, are there ways that Working with you, are there ways that can help me stay where I want to stay, mm -hmm. do what I want to do, you know, remain in my house? Yeah. Um, it's a great question. About eight years ago, um, I took a course through the Home Builders Association. It's one of the associations we belong to. Um, they offer all kinds of continuing, continuing education programs. Um, and I took this course that was called Certified Aging in Place Specialist. I hate the name. But it's sort of been picked up by AARP and various different associations now. Um, but what the training was, was for people to stay in their house long term, what needs to happen, what kind of modifications need to happen in the house so that they can do that. Um, and there are tons of small little things. Um, up, upgraded lighting as we age our eyesight dims. So increasing the size of light bulbs is something very similar, very mm -hmm. simple. Mm -hmm. um, if it's a two-story house, a vacuum cleaner on both levels. So you're not trying to carry it up and down the steps. Um, outside the front door, if you think about your grandmother or your parents, um, how feeble they get and how unstable they get, we oftentimes put a grab bar on the door frame outside the front door. Hmm. Or maybe, and, and also probably a little shelf. So if they're carrying their purse in, they're carrying groceries in, they set the things on the shelf and they're not juggling all those different things trying to get the key to open the door and get in. So it may not be a huge thing. Mm, it may that's be not a, always. A, a bunch of little things that, that make that house so, that much more livable. Yeah, and, and the bigger things would include the installation of, let's say, an elevator. Mm -hmm. uh, retrofitting an elevator is somewhat expensive, but it does save, it does keep you in the house. Um, things like uh, in the bathroom, 80% of the falls from elderly folks happen in the bathroom because of wet tile and it's slippery and everything else. Mm -hmm. uh, something else that's significant in the bathroom is that if you have a shower in the bathroom, the curb on the floor. The curb is a trip hazard. So we often, probably 80% of the showers we're doing now are, don't have a curb, it's barrier free. Hmm. And there are ways to waterproof the floor in the shower and outside the shower so there's no curb. That's, that's big. That is huge. Yeah. Because if 
If I didn't have a barrier in the shower, <laughs> it would go flooding right out the door. Yeah, well, you got to do it right. <laughs> I mean, you you got to know what you're doing. Um, and, and they are a little bit more costly, but because you're now waterproofing out into the room. But now so, I'm staying in my house. But now you're staying in your house. If you think about it, assisted living today is about $70,000 a year. Oh, easily, and so if, if so, if you if you invest thirty thousand dollars in a in a bathroom renovation that helps you stay in the house, like wider doors, that sort of thing, uh, helps you stay in the house, then um, it's it's more economical, really. And Absolutely. and being at home is it's it's more comfortable. People get older; they get stubborn. I know my my parents did, um, and um, it's hard to make the change. Change, that's one of those key words. Yeah. And so moving into a different residence People hate is it. very tough. Yeah. Uh, so if you can stay at home and, and be comfortable where yeah. you're, uh, that, that's big. So. Yeah. And one of the other larger projects we sometimes do is build a first floor master. Hmm. Um, and and the, there's a dual role for that. A first floor master saves you from walking up down the stairs. All right. Um, if you really need the assistance, the old master bedroom upstairs, becomes caregiver's quarters. Oh. So you can actually have live-in help in the house, and that keeps you from that nursing home up, up until the very end. I see you, know. you thought about this. So. It's, it's, it's a big part of our business. As a matter of fact, uh, my, my production manager and the other designer um, salesperson in our, in our organization, both of those guys also have the CAP certification. It really did turn me on uh, when I saw that whole thing. Um, in caring for this aging community, right. and also the people that have disabilities, you know, sure. we've, we've done veterans, we've done people who've had car accidents and they're quadriplegics. Um, we do all that kind of stuff. That's great. Yeah. Well, let's shift into about twelfth gear now. Got it. Estimates. Mm. Um, do you offer them free, and how do you feel about them? Yeah. Well. Whoever, whoever started the free estimate thing, it's a bit of a misnomer. Um, time is valuable. We all know that. Time costs money. We all know that. We do give complimentary estimates, but what I want people to understand is that they're not free. You know, when we do an estimate for a project, um, we generally invest six, sometimes seven hours of our time on behalf of that client who's not a client yet. Um, well, so, all the things we've talked about that you consider going into a project, I can see how that would get sit to six or seven hours in a big yeah, hurry. Yeah, uh, and that's not even before that's you know that's not even including plans. That's just mm -hmm. crunching numbers and doing the things we have to do to arrive at. Well, this is the price range for the project. Uh, somewhere in the middle is where we're going to end up. You know, um, be between the site visit at the house, the visit in the office to review the estimate, and the work in between, that's about the seven hour time frame. Right. So there's significant investment that yeah. you make up front before mm -hmm. you start yeah. working with a client. Yeah. So that that makes sense. Yeah. I mean, it, and, and, and at that point, you know, um, they may or may not work with us. Right. You don't right. know. For, you try to make you try to make it that way, but you never know. No. No. Um, well, we're talking about costs. Uh, Looking at remodeling versus new, I know this is a uh, something that has to go through the homeowner's mind. You know, do I go forward with this project on my current home, or do I look at new, which is more expensive? Mm -hmm. um, how how do you help folks with that? There's uh, the remodeling is undoubtedly more expensive because new home. If you think about building a new home, um, you don't have to worry about daily cleanup. You're not putting up dust protection. You're not dealing with the dog or the kids. Um, I, I mean, uh, the, yeah, the dog or the kids. Um, and carpet protection, runners up the staircase, all those different things don't happen in the new home. So that's one of the driving factors with remodeling um, that makes the cost higher. Mm -hmm. the, um, the other factor, um, and there's a, there's a plethora of them, you know, if I put a 40-yard dumpster on your driveway and fill that thing up, when the guy comes to pick it up, you're looking at an $80,000 truck assembly on your driveway. So you have broken driveways. Uh -huh. So all those different things play into the costs. So the question is, when somebody comes to me and looks at a project um, on their home versus moving, 
There are moving expenses, of course. There are unknowns. Am I moving in, into a neighborhood that has a friendly, welcoming, warm atmosphere? Um, in your backyard, you have trees. If you move into a new home, you're probably not going to have that. Yeah. So a lot of times, the, the neighborhood keeps people in the neighbor, keeps them there uh, through uh, friends. Um, I know in my neighborhood, we've got a greenway. goes through the neighborhood. We've got a pool, community pool. And then we also have a library right at the entrance. So people don't leave our neighborhood because of all the natural amenities that are around us um, and a lot of wooded lots. Mm -hmm. So that's a wrestling match. Now there are, we, and I've told people this in the office, when we get through reviewing the estimate, I'll say, you know what, folks? Don't do this project. You'll never get your money back. That's so, a tough conversation. Yeah, it is a to tough have. conversation. And, and, but sometimes that's the reality of the thing. If, if their project is too grand for the value of their home. Now, here's a trick. Um, if you think about the house values in the neighborhood, most of them are pretty much standard. There's less expensive houses, more expensive houses, but there, there is a, a price point level. Sure. Um, so if, if you do renovations to your home, even significant ones, kitchens and bathrooms and you know, aging in place stuff, all those things we talked about, and you're up here with the value of your home compared to your neighbors, over time, your neighbor's gonna do the kitchen, they're gonna do the bathroom, they're gonna do new driveway, and re-landscape. So you end up on par over time. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times that's the equation. Uh, in our economy here today has bounced back nicely after the recession. Right. Um, things, a lot of things happen. Um, and what I tell most people with the vast majority of the projects is, if you spend five years more in this house, if you commit to this house for five more years, you'll get back every penny you put into it. Plus, you get to enjoy it for five years, you know. So it's not a remodel and flip type. No, not, not for us, not for us. And the the flip, there are flippers out there that do a fairly decent job. But you got to think, if you watch HGTV and watch the flippers on there, they're putting in the cheapest products they can find. Um, Most of my clients don't go there. No, that, this is you know, where they, they want to be. They want nice kitchen cabinets with a nice warranty. They want granite countertops with a nice undermount sink. All those different things are part of. What drives the cost, you know? And you, you, can, you can get cabinets that cost this or this. Well, that leads into another question, and maybe you're addressing it as we're speaking. But when I've gotten estimates before, uh, there seems like there can be a, such a vast range, top to bottom. Yeah. How am I supposed to figure that yeah. out? It's, it's extremely difficult in, in my industry to compare apples for apples. Um, we do tend to be more expensive because we have to do have the showroom and we've got staff and we've got all the other things we talked about. Um, I think one of the driving factors is you call me for a kitchen project and we stand in the kitchen, you and I, and Joe Blow and you know the other guy and and you explain to me what you want. I'm building that project in my brain. All right? Um, you want a nice big island. You want a bar stools on the end with a raised portion for You're a talking bar. To me. You're talking um, to all me. those different things. And having the 18 years of experience plus my business in New York, um, I build that in my brain. And with that vision that I have, trying to duplicate the vision that you have, that's how I arrive at an estimate. You know, there's this crunch in numbers, really. Um, other people approach the project well. In order to get this guy to sign with me, I'm going to give him the cheapest price. And what happens is, this looks good. Maybe the agreement doesn't have a lot of detail in it, mm -hmm. right? But you sign on the bottom line anyway. And then the first thing you do out of the gate, here, Bob, I got a change order for those eight recessed cans that we're putting in your project. And oh, it's $1,500. And then the next thing you turn around, oh, I didn't know you wanted an undermount sink. Well, you thought you included it. No, it's not in the agreement. Uh, so okay. now the undermount sink. Mm -hmm. So when we've done we've done massive whole house remodeling projects, and we finished one up in North Raleigh, and it was uh, really significant, mid six figures, and um, with two change orders. If you define exactly what you're going to do on the project during the design process, it eliminates or nearly eliminates change orders. So is that communication? That's about the communication. It's about doing and a good job on design. It out. Sure. Yeah. Sure. If if you're picking out um, 
tile in our showroom and you pick a $10 square foot tile, it's my job to remind you, you know what you're doing to your budget, pushing it up. So those are all the things that's part of the design, part of the communication that leads to successful completion of these jobs. Sounds like almost a, a partnering relationship. Yeah, and, and, and that's one of the reasons that you really, a contractor, I don't, care who, I, don't, I don't care how good he is, he can't talk to you in that first meeting and give you a price. Too many? What, too many variables. Okay. What, he's, what, he's got, what he really has to be thinking about is a, is a range. We'll narrow that down once you pick everything out. Um, but some guys will go in, they'll, they'll write it down on the back of their business card, so here's the price of your kitchen. How does he know that? You know, <laughs> that's, that's the conundrum. And that's why the estimates have so much disparity. Because you really have to do your homework and, 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 and understand the complexity of me doing a project in your house while you're living here. So the experience matters. The experience does matter, yeah. And if a contractor tells you you can start tomorrow, don't hire him. There's a reason he's slow. <laughs> That's an indicator, right? It's an there. indicator, sure it is. Yeah. 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 John, we've talked about a lot of things today, mm -hmm. and I want to give an opportunity to, if we want to circle back around, is there anything that we haven't talked about that you think is important to, for the person out there to think about before they uh, commit to that project? I think there's one or two things, very, very briefly. Um, if you want to start a project in January, start planning now. Um, all the contractors that I know um, through the Home Builders Association, everybody's busy. That gets back to that, if they can start tomorrow, beware. Exactly, exactly. So <clears throat> the, what, I don't ever want to rush through the planning and designing stage because the better job you do during that, the better the execution on the other side. So allow enough for, for those who are considering a modeling project, allow a two month period or even three for a larger project to get through that selection process, through the, defi the fine tuning of the plans, all those sorts of things. Um, and one of the things that I didn't mention um, when we were talking about insurance and licensing and all that is that almost every project requires a building permit. Now we deal with six municipalities in the area. Each one has their own inspections department, Cary and Raleigh and White County and Apex. And um, they all have little nuances about how they do things. I wish they would standardize, but that's not the case. <laughs> um, but almost every project requires a building permit. If the contractor you're working with says, Bob, you go buy that, you go get that permit. That circumvents the process, because if I pull a building permit as a general contractor for your project, they verify that I have a license, they verify that I have insurance. If you pull the permit, they don't ask you any questions about that as the homeowner. So then I really don't know if my contractor's up to speed. Unless you do your homework. Yeah. So in, most, in, in every case, we pull the permit. And we're dealing with the inspectors and the plan review and all that kind of stuff. That's so th right. those were the points that I think we, we sort of went around. Right, right. So Great. Well, we've covered a lot of ground today, and, and I think folks should feel comfortable that uh, if they contact you about a project that... Uh, you've got the experience and have people on your team with the experience. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's always that thing about hire smart people. Um, and it sounds like you've done that so that you have a team that whoever they're working with, um, they're going to get um, a project that they're going to be comfortable with mm -hmm. and um, be happy about for years to come. Yeah. You don't, you don't want to finish that project and start looking around and going, why did I do this? You, yeah. want, you want that comfortable feeling that Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm, I'm good here for five, ten more yep. years, however long it is, and happy about what I chose. Yep. We are very glad to have had John Sparath with Blue Ribbon Residential Construction as our guest today. I want to thank you all for joining us. This is Bob Collier with RTP Business Live.